Blogging in 2022 is still one of the best ways to make money online. You can outsource writing, create articles, rank on Google, make affiliate commissions, ad revenue, sponsorships, all kinds of stuff. But it can get a little bit complicated and annoying. There's things like privacy policies, do you start an LLC, media liability insurance, how to add things into your website, WordPress, all of that. So in this video, I'm gonna go over all of blogging's tricky little details, things that are kind of annoying and things that might block you from finding success in your blogging business. So by the end of this video, you'll have a much clearer framework on all those tricky little details when it comes to blogging and how to find success in the 2020s. But before we get started, I want to invite you to watch my free masterclass on how I make over $300,000 a month between my blog and YouTube channel. Thousands of students have gone through it, so make sure to click the link in the description below, sign up for that 60-minute free training, and let's get into the topic for today. All right, so let's go down this list one by one on some of the blogging's tricky little details. So number one is privacy policies. So we all know that we need them, but we just don't know, you know, are they required? Do I need them right away? Do I need it within three to six months? Where do I put it? How do I do it? Well, basically you can take a look at my privacy policy and it covers some basic things, who we are, what personal data we collect and why we collect it. And then it comes, uh, there's my affiliate disclosure, which is really important. And then there's also um, a section here on Mediavine. So I, I'm a Mediavine advertiser, so I have banner ads on my site from them, and they actually give this for you to copy and paste, so I just pasted this in. And then we have a refund policy for Blog Growth Engine. So that's about it. And basically, I found this from other websites, and you can find like privacy policy templates that are really easy to use. The most important part here is just making sure that if you're collecting any information on your site that you're putting it in here, and you have a privacy policy. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but you should just find an, any other blog's example, find a template, and then just use one. The, the main one here is our uh, affiliate disclosure. So it says, you know, our company here is an affiliate of many tools, services, and products. We may earn commissions for purchases that are made by visitors to the site. These are promotional links that can be used to track a purchase. So that's the really important part. So when we view like an article of mine, for example, we also have the disclosure in the article right here. Some of the links may be affiliate links, and then it links to the privacy policy. So this is a no-follow link just to the privacy policy. I no-followed it just because I don't want to pass a bunch of SEO authority to my privacy policy page, but you can see you can read your full affiliate disclosure here. So honestly, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you're in an ad network, they'll give you one to copy and paste. You can find other blogs out there and templates and examples for privacy policies, but don't overthink it. Just create it, and then you can place it into your WordPress site, you know, either in the footer and then throughout in the content when you you know link to it in the affiliate disclosure. So next is thinking about actually setting up your business structure. So if you're in the United States, that could be like sole proprietorship, LLC, or S Corp. So the first probably 10 or 11 months of my blog, I just did a sole proprietorship. I had no business bank account yet and I was just kind of funding things through my personal account. I'm like, I'll do this as a sole proprietorship um, until I set up my actual business banking details. And I did that for far too long, probably 10 months longer than I should have. So I was just basically, I joined an affiliate program, I put my PayPal email address in, and I was making money as an individual. But after a while, I'm like, okay, I need to actually set this up. So there's a couple things you can do. You need to set up an LLC or an S Corp. Now you don't need to do this right away because we don't want to have perfectionism where we're doing all this business stuff before we're actually making a single dollar. Like I was making probably $20,000 a month before I even did this. So you want to get it in for organization and liability purposes. But don't overthink it. So an LLC basically is a limited, li limited liability company that protects you from like legal issues and things like that. So it separates your personal identity from the business, which is a good thing. And I chose to go with an S Corp because an S Corp has a number of benefits. So a single member S Corp like myself, I'm the single owner of the S Corp and there's certain tax advantages to that. So for example, I can pay myself a salary as the single owner and that salary is actually tax deductible because the salary to myself is an expense. So it's all a pass-through entity that also, you know, goes to my personal tax return and all of that stuff. But there are some tax loopholes and things that you can figure out with that. Ultimately, we just need to set up a business bank account because we want all the money to be going into that business bank account. We want, you know, your PayPal affiliate commissions going there, ad revenue, sponsorship revenue, any revenue should just go in one bank account with you know one service and every uh, expense can come out of that account so it's all one thing use a tool like quickbooks so i have quickbooks online you can pull in all the bank data and then start organizing and categorizing things but the key is probably want to get ahead of it sooner rather than later real quick i want to give you a word from our sponsor something that's really helpful and that's surfer seo's writers directory so surfer seo recently launched a writers directory where you can have individuals that have gone through their certification and already understand how to use surfer seo to assemble content so this saves you time and energy trying to find a writer on your own this is a highly curated group of writers that are the best people for you to hire so you can hire your first writer to 
today on Surfer's Writer's Directory. As you're looking to scale up your blogging business, finding quick wins to revenue is key. So as you're going through the Blog Growth Engine Masterclass, the course, you're becoming an expert in Surfer SEO. And this is actually exactly what qualifies you to be a certified writer for Surfer SEO customers. So if you love assembling content and writing, this is also a perfect way for you to earn additional income as you're building your blog and business. So you can take the SEO Writing Masterclass to become certified, and it will help you become more efficient and effective in building your own blogging business. So go to the link in the description to find a writer for your blog today or sign up to be the next Surfer SEO expert. So next, let's talk about insurance. So as a business owner, do we need insurance for our blog? Well, when we're first starting out, the answer is almost always no. That's an expense that isn't really required. But uh, over the course of the last couple of years, I purchased uh, media liability insurance, which is actually important from like a copywriting and legal standpoint. Because I actually was attempted to get sued. Someone tried to sue me. And this is what it was. So here's an interesting article on it. It says, here come the copyright bots for hire with lawyers in tow. Anyone can now find infringers, send, out, send takedown requests, and quickly demand thousands in damages. Can the trolls be far behind? So what was interesting is that I was attempted to get sued by a German company because they scan every single web page on the internet and they look for any type of copyrighted images. And what I had is I had a video based, uh, I had an embedded image in a blog post from a YouTube video. And inside of that YouTube video was a tiny part of a copyrighted image of like a mountain or a lake or something. So they were trying to, you know, basically get five to $10,000 out of me saying that they're going to sue me and take me to court and all those things. So it really got me thinking, I probably want to get some liability insurance if, you know, once you're big enough, if you're kind of starting out and it doesn't really make sense because media liability insurance can cost a hundred, two hundred dollars a month. So you don't really want to be spending that out of the gate. But once you're starting to make a good amount of revenue, you do want to probably protect yourself just for peace of mind. I've never had to use it. That case was thrown out because I basically said, all right, come sue me, get my actual, they were trying to just send me emails. And I said, I'm not answering any more emails. If you want to contact me, send me, you know, mail through the post. So they actually would have had to find my address, do all of these different things. And they just gave up. They quit because it wasn't really that specific example wasn't strong enough to, to talk about in court. So it's interesting to know, like, if you're using a bunch of copyrighted imagery and materials or like potentially getting sued, if you make money, the odds of getting sued rise. So you want to have liability insurance. So I got it through Cover Wallet, which covers all kinds of different things. If you're a publisher of any kind, like a blogger, um, it'll basically cover defamation, plagiarism, copyright infringement, invasion of privacy, all of those different things. But it kind of gives you that peace of mind. So I would say ignore it for a while until you're making a good amount of money and you have something to lose and you have, you know, uh, a lot of attention on your blog where you might it might make sense to get insurance. So now that we got some of that technical stuff out of the way, let's talk about the actual website, the actual blog and little details we can cover on there. So first of all, here's an article of mine on the seven best call tracking software apps of 2022. And we can see that there's my author box here. And then there's also an updated March 16th, 2022. So what's interesting is like, Every article on a blog has a publish date, so the original publish date that it was published, and then it has any time that you update it, it'll have an update date. Now, it won't always, every theme won't always show that updated date. And it's good to have it because Google then knows, okay, this was last updated on this date. It's newer, it's fresher, and they can actually add that date into the search engine results page so that people can actually see it, which might in turn get click-through rates, but it is a good thing to have. And not all themes have it. So what you could use is a tool like this WP Last Modified Info. And what that does is it basically tells Google and it shows on your website the, t the actual text when the article was last modified. So it shows it in your post and it can make it say, you know, updated on this date, which is a good thing. All right, so when we look at this post again, we see that there's a number of different things here. There's the heading, you know, the title of the article, some pictures, some text, intro text, headings, photos, all of that. This actually all starts for me as a Google Doc. And I use Google Docs because one, you can outsource the writing to a third party or a freelancer or someone else. You can dictate the writing rules. You can also, what's really important I wanna cover is like importing images. So how do you import images effectively into WordPress? Well, it's kind of a pain if you go like in the WordPress editor and then go to the media library and add them individually one at a time, or you could just add them all at once. So what I do is we can use a tool uh, we use Google Docs, and then you can see it's the exact same article here. And this is an image. And what we do is there's a screenshot. So you just take a screenshot of the home page, like for example, on this, um, or you take a screenshot of something if it's not copyrighted. And then you want to make it, you know, only as wide as your blog is itself. So maybe it's 700 pixels wide. So you can use like the Apple or, you know, PC, just basic image editor, make sure it's only 700 or 800 pixels wide. So shrink it in, save it so it's around 50 kilobytes or less. 
and then import it. So basically insert image, do that into your Google Doc, and then there, and then you put it there. And then you can use a WordPress plugin to import this into WordPress. So you can see that there's a number of different images here, pricing, lots of images, and they're all just basically added into the Google Doc. And then when I'm ready to import it into WordPress, you use either a tool like Mammoth Docx Converter. So this is a good WordPress plugin that basically you just upload the entire document in, and then it adds all of the images to your media library that are in the doc with file names. So if you have a file name for your image, it'll just automatically put it there. And if you have short pixel as your image optimizer, it'll automatically optimize the image too. So basically this tool, Mammoth Docx Converter, it pulls in all the content into the WordPress post editor adds all the images to the media library, gives them names based on the file name, and optimizes them and makes them smaller. So it's all one thing, boom, from Google Docs right into WordPress. Another paid option is Wordable, which is a Google Doc to WordPress in one click editor. Both of these editors are great, so check them out. And you can use them to get from Google Doc into WordPress. You might also notice here this sidebar widget here, which is actually Surfer SEO's Google Docs integration. So this is the Surfer content editor. And it literally can tell one of your writers as they're editing in Google Docs, like exactly what to do. So the word count, the score, what words they need to add in, and all the semantic keywords they should add. So it really gives, uh, it's really great for on-page SEO and gives you all the data you need to really make a great article right inside of Google Docs. All right, so let's talk about other aspects of blogging, which is like there's content within the article, but there's also like I have this table of contents over here on the right-hand side, and you can see that it actually scrolls with the article to make it easier to digest. And one thing that's great about blogging is like you want to give people the best user experience possible. So if they have a table of contents that actually is a fixed widget and they can scroll with it, it makes the article a lot easier to read because they know what they're getting. They don't have to scroll through the entire thing to find anything, and they can use that. So that's called a fixed widget. So a widget, the sidebar on a blog is called a widget. And a widget is basically a, a piece of information or a place on the blog that isn't directly a poster page, but can put content inside of it. And what you can look for is you can go to the WordPress plugin directory, just search for something like fixed widget. And you can see here, fixed widget and sticky elements for WordPress. So you can dictate which elements in the sidebar are sticky and which are not. So for example, you see like my affiliate disc disclosure here is not sticky and it just goes down, but then this one is. So ultimately, uh, you can use a fixed widget plugin, and that helps you create like easy table of contents and things like that. I also use the easy table of contents plugin for WordPress, uh, which is a great WordPress plugin. And it basically takes like headings, like it can take H2s, H3s, and just make them automatically into a table of contents. And you can then paste that into the sidebar and make it a fixed widget. All right, so let's talk about links on your blog. Links are a hugely important thing, whether it's internal links, outbound links, external links from other sites pointing to you. Links are basically how web pages are connected. So we need to deeply understand how that works. So here's an article on mine on the best email marketing software. And we can see that there's a number of different, I have this formatted with uh, ultimate add-ons for Gutenberg. These are just individual columns with text, images, and buttons that are all within that. Very simple. And then we have the intro, and we can see the links here. So we have a couple affiliate links to begin with. I'm getting right to the, you know, right into it. Want to jump straight to my top picks. Boom, here they are. These are nofollow affiliate links because all affiliate links should be nofollow. And I use Thirsty Affiliates to cloak these affiliate links. Uh, it's a great, like, affiliate link organizer basically you download the free plugin and then you can paste in your unique aff affiliate links and then it makes them look nice so for example active campaign you can see at the bottom left it says adamanfro.com slash recommend slash active campaign the real link that's redirected to the real link which is some long string of numbers and letters that isn't that good to look at and also when you add you know uh, thirsty affiliates, what you can do is when you're editing your post in the post editor, you basically highlight the text. You want to have the link. You click this new thing in the post editor that is thirsty affiliates. And then you just search for the link, put it there. And then anytime that you edit the link in the, within thirsty affiliates in the dashboard, it will update all of the links that you've had. So it's really easy to use. Then we'll talk about other links. So like, you'll see that I have another link here. So $38 for every $1 spent. That is a outbound link to an article on email marketing statistics. Then we have plus it says there are 1.5 billion active Gmail users. Another interesting statistic, which is an outbound link to a CNBC article. Then we have internal link, internal link, and internal link. So how do we do these things? You know, what are we do? What are we looking for? There's three types of links here. There's affiliate links. There's outbound external links, and then there's internal links. So. There's no perfect way to do this, but what I, how I look at it is every affiliate link should be no follow. We don't want to pass any SEO value to them. They're basically um, monetized links, so they're all no follow, and thirsty affiliates can automatically do that. And then if it's a statistic, if it's a helpful thing, we want to push links out to websites that are authorities in the space that we're 
working in. So I don't want to, you know, link out to a statistic in some shady directory site with a domain rating of one. I want to push them to CNBC or Wikipedia or something like a news outlet or a high authority site in my niche like Bluehost or, you know, one of these sites. And if it is a statistic, it should be do follow. You know, we want to pass link value there. And it's not like it's, you know, absorbing all the link value that aren't going to be passed to your internal links. It's actually showing Google like, hey, I'm showing this information too, and this is helpful, and this is an authority, and um, it's a good thing to pass uh, do follow links out from your blog. And then we talk about internal links. So these should also be do follow, and they can be based on, you know, a little bit heavier on the keywords that you want to focus on. So you can see uh, this one is choosing the right email marketing software, and that's basically what this is about. So how to choose email marketing software. And then we see this one is on sending cold email, so that's an article on cold email software, and then for Gmail add-ons, so that's one on Gmail add-ons. So you can be more specific and exact in your keywords when you're doing internal links. But ultimately, we want to have a mixture of all of these. We want to make sure that we always have internal links uh, in the early parts because the higher the link is on the page, the more value is passed. So hypothetically, it would probably make sense for me to move like some of my own internal links above of these two, but whatever, there's no perfect formula to it. But that's kind of how to think about links from both affiliate links, internal links, and outbound do follow links. So finally, let's talk about content siloing and structuring and the URL structure and all that stuff. So here's an article of mine on choosing a CRM. And you can see that if you look at the URL, it's actually living underneath the CRM software post. So choosing a CRM. Now, basically, this isn't 100% required. Now you can use all of your posts can just be blog posts and you can put them in your blog role like this. But you can also, if you want to, and you have a really important post on your blog, you can start to create like sub pages and sub blog posts related to a top level page that you really wanna rank. Because this is telling Google that like my CRM software article is here. And then underneath that, less important is an article on choosing a CRM. It's like a supporting page really. So when we look at the best CRM article, it's right here. I want to get as many, you know, internal authority content, you know, related informational content around this article. So when I Google, if I do a new uh, incognito window and I look for best CRM, I'm typically on page one. So I'm right between HubSpot and Neil Patel for best CRM. And we can see that it's got a few, what's nice is this has a few FAQ schema blocks. So that's another thing that we can do is with a tool like Yoast, you can create FAQ schema code and just add that as a new type of, uh, inside your post, you can add that block in, and then you can see that that actually shows up here. It makes it a little bit nicer looking and bigger. But ultimately we see that. So we wanna have a lot of supporting content because if I'm writing about CRMs, I should have a lot of different content about CRMs. So I have like choosing the right CRM. What is a CRM? We also have CRM statistics here, the 72% of companies, that's an internal link. We also have like CRM databases. Email marketing is somewhat related. And we have enterprise CRM. So a lot of different internal links. And when you can see this, you see like CRM software is the top level parent page. And then if I go to something like um, CRM statistics, you'll see that that isn't. It's just a straight up blog post. So none of this is perfect, right? Like we just want to make sure that internally we're linking to things that are related. But you can see that when I do choosing a CRM, that actually is living under CRM software. So you can see, you know, you can do this for important articles that you really want to focus on and provide informational content around. And you can do that either by creating blog post category specific to that and then having you know, showing that category. Or what you really want to do is kind of create top level pages and child pages within WordPress. So you can say, choosing a CRM is actually a child page of CRM software. And then you have a number of child pages underneath your main one, propping it up, linking up to it. And that CRM software doesn't always have to link down, but it, all the links up pointing to it and propping up that one informational page. So start to think about your URL structure as well when it comes to blogging. So ultimately blogging is a very lucrative way to make money online, rank content on Google, make affiliate commissions, ad revenue, and all of that. But some of these tricky little details can often be overlooked. So I hope a lot of these things were interesting to you and helpful. Let me know if I missed anything, you know, comment below with any questions you have on other details when it comes to blogging. And please, if you wanna learn how I make $300,000 a month with my online business, exactly what I'm doing from a content perspective, make sure to watch my free blogging masterclass. It's 60 minutes of training, everything in my brain condensed down into one masterclass. So make sure to give that a watch. Please like the video, hit that notification bell, and I will see you in the next video.